Good morning. We're here with uh, Sharon Terry, the founder and CEO of the Genetic Alliance. Sharon, I was wondering if you could tell us what motivated you to become a pioneer in, in this field. Sure. So my two children were diagnosed with a disease called pseudoxanthoma elasticum, which is one of the 7,000 rare diseases and causes vision loss and heart issues and some circulation issues. And my husband and I going along as ordinary parents, suddenly were thrust into this whole world of biomedicine and research, et cetera, and tried to find a way to help the kids and their disease, which expanded into helping the thousands with that disease and then expanding, expanded further really into looking at the millions of people who suffer from genetic diseases. So the very first things we did was read about the disease and discover quickly that we didn't know the language even of biomedicine, that it's really difficult words that are long and very esoteric. And so we get, got ourselves dictionaries and we took small courses and we uh, kept looking at how do we understand what needs to be done. And we very quickly learned that nobody was working on this disease and we thought that was shocking. As, a, as parents, you think, of course, everyone's taking care of everything, and this is not something I have to do. But we did learn that, in fact, many diseases have no one working on them, or there isn't solutions for the diseases. And so we went off and uh, we established a blood and tissue bank to store tissue and blood clinical records. Uh, we also put together a research consortium of uh, r research labs that were interested or would become interested in the disease. And we went on to discover the gene by working at night in a lab. And we patented the gene so that we could be the steward of the gene. Uh, we've developed a diagnostic test that we've licensed to a small lab uh, in the US and in several countries throughout the world. Uh, and now we're looking at therapeutics, uh, mouse models, those sorts of things. You yourself, an, an ordinary citizen, as you described yourself, went into the lab to discover the gene affecting your children? Yes, this was quite fun. Uh, there was a very generous scientist at Harvard who would let us use some lab space and had a uh, postdoc working on this disease. And so we would go about 10 o'clock at night when we had a neighbor come in and watch our kids because they were about four and six years old. And we would work uh, scoring gels in those days, much more, very much more primitive than today. And my husband is dyslexic, and so he could see patterns in the data that was being generated and, in fact, discover the locus first and then they put it through the software and saw that, in fact, the gene was where it was. What a fantastic story. Um, you mentioned several times in your talk today uh, the importance of increasing transparency at all levels for the adoption of P4 medicine. What are the issues with, uh, with I presume, a lack of transparency today? So I, th I find this really compelling because I think if we just increased transparency, we would go a long way towards solving the problems we have. So for example, drug companies, rightfully so, work really hard on something and then get almost to the finish line and have a failure. Well, that failure is just tucked away in their shelf. Or even when they have a success, they themselves will say one division of the company doesn't understand how there was a success from the other division of the company. And so that's a very simple example of the fact that if we could have transparency on the data, on the process, we would in fact be able to share that information and not make the same mistakes over. Another place that's really important to me is genetic testing. There are thousands of genetic tests done by thousands of labs around the world, and those processes are not reported in a way that everyone can understand. How are they being done? What version of the test is being used? What kind of machine is used? What version of the machine, et cetera? If we knew that, we would be able to iteratively improve those tests in a much more dynamic way. Uh, and we as public uh, would understand what kind of test am I being offered? When I get a result, a PSA or a mammogram, is that re result the same from one lab to another? The answer is actually no. And the public thinks they are the same. They think wherever you go, you're getting good medicine. And it is good medicine, but it really needs to be of a higher quality. Regulatory science needs to be improved, and measurement science needs to be improved. So I do think full sequencing will be coming soon, and I think faster than we know. And I think in some ways we're building systems for today's uh, structures that, in fact, will be out of date. So yes, you're trying test by test to get adoption or test by test to get uh, coverage from insurance companies or national health systems. Uh, we ev eventually, and fairly quickly, I think, will have the kind of sequencing that will allow the individual to know what, in fact, their genome carries. I think it gets a little hard around 
genomics uh, in the sense of understanding combinations of genes and their effect because pure sequencing won't give us that until we actually par pair that with good informatics and good algorithms, which certainly is possible because essentially the genome is information. You know, I think for the public it's really hard to understand, oh, what are these, all these letters and how do they interact? And I think if we understand it's a finite set of information that then, yes, we need robust information tools to dig out the information and understand what it means, uh, that that will make it all much more affordable. And we would be laughing at ourselves probably 10 years from now to have this discussion today. If I may uh, ask you another question. Um, I've heard that you were uh, very actively involved in the passing of the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. Can you tell me about that? Sure, that was quite an amazing thing. So again, you know, I'm just a mom thrown into this whole medical arena, and then I'm just a mom thrown into this whole political arena, essentially. And there's a saying in the U.S., um, you don't want to know how legislation is made just like you don't want to know how sausage is made. Um, it's delicious, but you don't want to see it in the process. So um, I, I spent about 12 years working with various members of the Senate and the House in the U.S., the Congress, um, asking all kinds of questions in terms of developing this legislation, dickering and bartering and trading various pieces of the legislation, uh, late night sessions with, with uh, people that were trying hard to get it passed and people who were trying hard not to let it get passed um, until we actually came to the point where it was unanimously passed in both the House and the Senate. Um, it protects people in insurance and employment. Uh, in the U.S., you know, our, our health insurance is risk-based, and so it's not a right. Essentially, you have to purchase it usually through your employer, and so now you can't be discriminated against on the basis of your genetic information. Um, it, we have concerns about the fact that it does not extend to life insurance or to long-term care insurance, uh, and that's another area that we really want to work on. Thank you very much.